So, why are we not all enlightened? It's a little problem. What we call fetters. Ten fetters. And I hope you all have this chart. Anybody not got the chart of ten fetters? Okay. Number one. Sakaya Diti. Diti is a view or a belief. Sakaya is the personality belief or the self-belief, the self-delusion. The delusion that we are solid, existing beings. As I mentioned earlier, we're not. We are only this flowing on of the aggregates arising and passing away from moment to moment. And because we have this self-delusion, other problems follow from that. We feel we have to protect the self. We get upset when someone insults us or says something nasty to us. We get hurt. We want to also boost up our self. We want to attain fame and power all sorts of things that enhance our concept of self. And it is this which lies at the root of many, many, many of our problems. This notion of a solidly existing self which has to be enhanced, protected, cajoled, looked after, pandered to. So this is the first of the fetters because it is so fundamental to our concept of, of what we are. We won't be able to eliminate that absolutely and completely until enlightenment is attained. But we can at least have some elementary understanding that what we are composed of are these five khandhas, the five grasping groups, all of which are in a state of change, all of which are in a, in a state of flux. So that is um, a fetter as long as we believe we have to look after this self and pander to it and um, protect it, it, this is what leads to conceit, to arrogance, to pride. So it's a very, very dangerous concept. And we all suffer from it. The second fetter, vichikicca, skeptical doubt. For example, what was I in the past? What shall I be in the future? Um, where did I come from? Where am I going to? The Buddha encouraged investigative doubt. Investigative doubt is where you have a question about something, you dig in, investigate, you find the answer, you've widened your understanding, and that's helpful, that's good. When you ask a question, and you get an answer to your question, that increases your understanding. That's fine. But this skeptical doubt this relates to questions which you can't answer. 
but you keep asking them. The Buddha likened this to being lost in a desert without a map. You don't know, should I go this way or, or this way, or I don't know, what about this way? I, I, you, know, you don't know where to go. So many questions. Which way shall I go? But you can't find an answer to your question, but you keep asking the questions. The antidote to this is the development of a quality which is called sadda, S-A-D-D-H-A, -D -D sadda. Sadda is sometimes translated as faith, but we do not recognize something which is generally called blind faith. Blind faith is when you believe in something, even though you don't have any particular reason to believe it. You just accept it. Sadda is usually translated better as confidence based on knowledge. When you have a knowledge about something, then you develop confidence in it. If we could know what goes on in the mind of a hen sitting on her eggs, we should know that she's not just sitting there thinking, well, I hope something happens. I'm going to sit here for a few days. Maybe something will happen. No, she understands. Providing she maintains these eggs at the right temperature for the right amount of time, there's going to be a hatching of eggs, and chicks are going to appear. So, although those eggs haven't yet hatched out, she is confident that they will do, because she knows what is necessary. So, if you take the, the Buddhist path as a, a set of, maybe, instructions, if you ask somebody for instructions, uh, how do I get from, from here to Hammersmith? And you're told, uh, well, go out of the Vihara, turn to your right, um, walk along 100 yards, there's many roundabout, and then another 100 yards, you'll find the, the tube station on the left, you go on up to the end of the road, you'll find Barclays Bank in front of you. At those traffic lights, turn to your left. You've got some instructions. To begin with, you don't know for sure whether these instructions are any good or not. But you start. And as you progress, your experience bears out what the instructions told you. Ah, oh, yes. There's the mini roundabout. There's Turning Green Tube Station. There's Barclays Bank. So now you begin to develop confidence. You haven't yet got to Hammersmith, but you have the confidence that these instructions are going to help you get to Hammersmith. So far, your experience has confirmed that these instructions are accurate. So now you're developing confidence. That is what we were calling faith, sadha. The third fetter, Silabata Paramasa, the adherence to <coughs> wrongful rites and rituals and ceremonies, believing that there is something inherent in the particular ritual which has some power. I've already mentioned that at that time the Brahmin priests were extremely powerful because they had the monopoly on the performance of sacrificial rituals. And these rituals were supposed to be very, very powerful. In fact, they didn't always work. People got sick, rain never came, crops withered up, 
what's the problem with that? Um, we shouldn't believe that the mere performance of a ritual has some kind of special power. Some people say that in order to purify yourself, you should take a bath, a purificatory bath. And the Buddha said, if washing alone could make us pure, then the purest beings must be fish. So again, he's saying that don't go and spend your time washing yourself and believing that you are having some kind of purificatory right here. So he was trying to get people away from superstition, from empty belief, from the idea that some practices will be of use, will be of help. And he said, if you want to cross a river, there's no point in performing some ritual. Either build a bridge or build a boat, but don't mess around on the bank with some kind of special ceremony. But as long as we persist in this belief, then, of course, this, ha this, is, a, this is a fetter. It's going to stop us making progress. Number four, karma raga. Karma. We've had this with karma tanha, the desire for sense pleasures. Raga is a synonym for tanha. So this is the desire for sense pleasures. The Buddha said that our natural inclination is to seek out sense pleasures. But he also said, it is like a thirsty man drinking salt water. Sense pleasures that we get do not satisfy our desires. We always want some additional sense pleasure. We always want more, 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 in the mistaken belief that providing we keep on getting sense pleasures, we're going to have, ha have happiness. Well, if you really could live your life in such a way that you were always getting some pleasurable stimulus, <laughs> you might achieve a state of happiness, but a rather precarious state. So this attachment to uh, sense pleasures is at the heart of the second noble truth. So that again is a fetter, holds us back. Then we have viapada. Um, ill will or anger. This is a similar word as patiga. It means to hit against. So we come into either mental, verbal, or physical conflict with others. This can be on an individual basis, it can be on a national basis, but it is all a form of anger or hatred or ill will. Now the sixth fetter is called Rupa Raga, and the seventh is A Rupa Raga. To explain that, would you please look at your chart of the 31 
realms of existence. Now we have Rupa Raga and Arupa Raga. So Raga is a desire. And the terms Rupa and Arupa we had with the five aggregates. The first aggregate was Rupa, material form. And so there are certain planes of Rupa, of material form. And those, if you look at your chart of the 31, are the 16 in the top page called fine material sphere planes. We can call those the Rupa planes. And above them are the immaterial sphere planes, not material. And in the Pali language, you can make a negative by putting the letter A in front of it. So Rupa becomes a Rupa, no Rupa, not material. So with feta number six, you have a wish, a desire to be reborn in one of these 16 fine material sphere planes. That's numbers 12 up to 27. And the Arupa Raga is the desire for rebirth in one of these immaterial sphere planes, numbers 28 to 31. You might think, yeah, I've got a lot of problems in this world, but it would be really nice to spend a few great eons enjoying myself in one of these high planes. But as I said a moment ago, the Buddha never recommended that we should strive for rebirth in any of these higher planes because they're not going to help us to attain Nibbana. That's why the human plane is such an important plane. So if you want to uh, attain birth in one of these Rupa or Arupa planes, then you're still not going to escape from the state of samsara, just cycling along, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, going on and on and on and on and on. You'll still be tying yourself to samsara. So that is why the Buddha said that both of these, Rupa Raga and Arupa Raga, would be or are a form of feta. Number eight is mana. It's usually translated as conceit. And I think we all know what we mean by conceit, by pride, arrogance. But the literal meaning of the word mana is measuring. And yes, if you measure yourself against others and, and, and decide, yeah, I'm superior to all these people. I'm better than they are. That is conceit. But if you, if you measure yourself and consider that you are inferior, I'm worse than. I'm just a miserable worm in comparison with X, Y, and Z. That is also mana. It's also a form of measuring. So the first form was what we might call the superiority complex. The second kind is the inferiority complex. That's also a form of measuring. And indeed, even to measure and conclude, I'm the equal. I'm as good as he is. I've got as good a car as he has. Or I've got as well paid a job as he has for me. That is also measuring. Yes, we are all different. We're not the same. We are different. We, should, we can recognize that we're different. But don't draw from that a conclusion that you are either better or worse, higher or lower. Just acknowledge there are differences. But to go around comparing yourself with others is not, not skillful, not helpful, not, not beneficial. I mean, even in 
even in the spiritual world, we have conceit, the, uh, the sanctimonious person who thinks he's very holy. How long do you spend meditating each day? Oh, only 20 minutes. Oh, I sit for an hour every day. Do you only keep five precepts? I keep eight precepts. Five precepts. Yeah. So there's room even in the, even in the spiritual life that you can get conceited. Then the next letter is udacha. This is a state of the mind where it is continuously disturbed distracted, restless, excited. There's no tranquility, there's no peace in the mind. Always agitation. We sometimes talk about the monkey mind. The monkeys, when you see them in the trees, they run up here, then they dash over there, then back here, up there, and down there, and along there. They're always charging around all over the place. That's like our minds. You spend a few minutes watching your mind. And there'll be one thought followed by another thought, followed by another thought, in all sorts of different directions, on all sorts of different subjects. So the mind is very restless, very dis like the surface of water, disturbed by the wind whipped up into agitation and restlessness. And then the last of these fetters is avidja, which is, uh, a is negative, vidja is to see, we get the English word vision from the same root, avidja, not seeing, or ignorance, also known as moha. It is ultimately not seeing the truth that is the cause of our journeying on in samsara, life after life after life. 